My name is Michelle Chung, and I'm the director of TRUE, a public-private partnership with the goal of helping organizations accelerate their adoption of technology. If you wanna see how AI for call center can decrease your call volume by 70% or how you can visualize your data and make data-driven decisions, TRUE would like to support you in your journey. We know this can be an investment through this network of like-minded individuals. We're leveraging each other's knowledge and experience to help each other get the most out of technology and data while creating an ecosystem where we can support each other. Some days you're sharing solutions, some days you're benefiting from someone else's, but through it all, organizations in Hawaii strengthen through this collaboration. In supporting Hawaii's digital transformation, data and innovation efforts, this supports TRUE's mission of creating tech-enabled jobs here in Hawaii. The True, initiative is a, an, the True is an initiative of the Hawaii Executive Collaborative. If you're interested to learn how you or your organization can be a part of True, or to see other use cases and solutions, please visit us at hec.org slash true or connect with me. Today's webinar is focused on how to become a digital first organization and how you can engage customers in a new way. We'll hear a lot about digital transformation, which is accelerated during COVID. Today, we'll hear about one organization's journey and get a backstage pass into their rebrand and digital products. We have a short agenda today. We're gonna to start off with the presentation revolving around Central Pacific Bank as a use case, and then we will be opening it up to Q&A. A couple of quick reminders. Please feel free to send in any questions you have for Kevin during the um, using the Q&A function and we'll address them right after his presentation. Session is being recorded and it'll be made available. And at the end of the webinar, there'll be a short survey that you can, where you can provide your feedback. Please take two minutes to, to complete it so that we um, make sure that our events meet your needs. And with that, I would like to invite Kevin up. Oops. Kevin, if you could enable your camera, please join me in welcoming Kevin Dolstrom, Chief Marketing Officer of Central Pacific Bank. He's been a founder and a senior exec to five tech startups and three public companies and has over 25 years of digital marketing and product development experience. Aloha everybody. Um, get my video started here. I'm gonna share a presentation. All right, thank you, Michelle, and thank you to everyone for tuning in. Uh, I'm pretty excited to tell the story of our transformation at Central Pacific Bank. You know, we actually began our transformation uh, right before COVID happened. And so uh, the timing ended up being great because as you know, and as Michelle mentioned, COVID really accelerated everything. It really accelerated the need, and especially for banks to transform themselves into digital first organizations. And so. I'm going to tell you the story of how we did that. As Michelle said, you'll get a backstage pass. Uh, I'm going to present for about 20 minutes, and then you can ask any questions you want. I'm open to personal, professional. Uh, the wilder the question, the, the better. So I thought first I'd start off with a little bit about me. Uh, so I just joined Central Pacific Bank as the chief marketing officer uh, a little over a year ago, as I said, right before the, the pandemic. And it's kind of a fun story of how I joined so um, I, I split my time right now between Honolulu and Boulder, Colorado, and I had moved my family to Boulder and was planning to take some time off between gigs before I looked for my, my next gig. And I got a call out of the blue from a friend of mine that I worked with two companies ago. And he said, hey, uh, I just joined the board of this bank in Hawaii called Central Pacific Bank. And they, hired, they recently hired a new CEO and he's a tech guy. He's really looking to change things and, and do some interesting things. Are you interested? And I said, well, Chris, you had me at Hawaii. So of course I'm interested. But actually it was very serendipitous because uh, the things that Paul Yonamine, our CEO, wanted to do aligned incredibly well with some of my own views on where banking is headed, where business is headed in general. So it was incredibly serendipitous. So one tip I would have for any of you folks who are younger in your career is, always leave companies on good terms and maintain relationships with the people that you work with because that's how serendipity happens. It happens over a long course of time. But in, in my case, uh, every single job I've ever had has come through that sort of serendipity through my network. 
So I've been in financial services for a long time, mostly with smaller companies, with startup type companies. I also do a lot of angel investing and I advise companies on the side. And as you can tell from this picture, I'm also an avid rock climber. That's why I spend a good bit of the year in Colorado. This is one of my favorite pictures uh, that's about five minutes away from where I live. Uh, I've got a family, um, a wife and two daughters. And if you wanna follow some of my thoughts um, on banking and on life, you can check me out on Twitter at Camp4. There's a link in my profile that actually goes in. It's, it's a long article on Medium uh, about some of my thoughts on how banking is going is, is transforming. And so if you want more detail, just look at that link in my Twitter profile. So I like to, I always like to start with our mission at Central Pacific Bank. And our mission is to bring the Aloha spirit to banking. And you may think that that sounds a little bit frou-frou, uh, not really concrete, but that's on purpose because if you think about banking, you know, imagine, uh, for example, a big bank, whatever you imagine the Aloha spirit to be, banks are anything but that. And so then, then take a moment and imagine what a bank might look like that brings the Aloha spirit to banking. Again, whatever you might imagine the Aloha spirit to be, it would probably look very different than today's banks. And that's really what we're trying to do at Central Pacific. So as we entered this transformation, we had really three guiding principles. Number one, Paul, our CEO, was very clear that he wanted to become a digital first bank. And what that means is everything you do, you do it first with an eye toward digital. And that's based on an assumption that digital is very quickly going to become the primary channel for all banks. And we're not excluded from that. The second thing is an idea that we stole from Google, actually, which is 10x thinking. So, you know, it's easy within a company to identify lots of incremental improvements. And those things are important. I call those the 10% wins. But it's equally important to think really big and think 10x. Like how, how could we scale our company 10x over the next few years? Those big ideas uh, are really what drives the long-term growth of any company. And then finally, we wanted to stay true to our roots. And I'll talk a lot about our history, but, but we've got an amazing um, legacy at Central Pacific Bank, and we didn't want to stray from that. In fact, it's really hard to stray from the things that you can authentically do as a company. So I'll start off by talking a little bit about the banking landscape, uh, and hopefully a lot of this will ring true to you as uh, a banking customer. So first of all, banking is an enormous industry. It's a trillion dollar industry in the US alone. I'm talking about revenue, um, and it, but it's in the midst of a major disruption. If you look at the banking industry, there's roughly 10,000 banks in the US uh, and about half the market is, um, is the big four banks. So JP Morgan, Bank of America, Wells Fargo and Citibank. And what I often like to say is the way that you bank today is actually almost identical to the way that your grandfather banked, you know, decades ago. Now you've got an app in your pocket, so that's different, but really the way that the, the banking products work, the processes, the relationship works is the same. And it's been the same for, for many decades, but that's starting to change uh, in a couple of ways. Number one is the neobanks are coming. So if you don't know what a neobank is, it's really a startup type technology company that is partnered with the bank um, to, to really deliver a new digital experience for banking. And so examples would be Cash App, which you're probably familiar with. There's a neobank called Chime. And if you look at this chart on the left side of this slide, it's really eye-opening because it shows how JP Morgan grew over really decades of time, how they grew their active user base or their account holder base, you know, to get to about 60 million active account holders. Then you, the purple and the green lines are for Venmo and Cash App. And look how quickly they've been able to scale to the same level and look at the tra trajectory they're on. So this is a real threat to banking and it's really tr starting to transform the way consumers think about banks. The second trend going on is, you know, crypto and, and decentralized finance are really transforming all aspects of financial services. So, you know, obviously we've all heard of, of Bitcoin and crypto trading and decentralized finance is, is something that you may not know as much about, but it's really the larger transformation that's happening in financial services. You might've heard of companies like Coinbase, which has well over 60 million crypto accounts or companies like BlockFi. And these companies, are approaching financial services from a completely different angle, and they are absolutely entering um, the banking space, starting to offer things like checking accounts and credit cards. So that's yet another threat that banks face. And then finally, I actually believe the biggest 
trend that's happening in banking right now is that money is starting to infiltrate culture. And so if you look at what some of the neo banks have done, for example, I'll talk about Square, which has the cash app. You know, Square has um, added Jay-Z to its board of directors. It launched an apparel line a few months ago. Um, the cash app has been mentioned in lots of rap songs. And so the, these new types of banks are really making their way into culture. And that's actually potentially the biggest threat of all to traditional banks because it, because it could make them irrelevant to younger customers. So related to that, you know, younger customers think differently than the previous generations and they're much more socially con conscious. And, you know, I mentioned earlier that I'm a rock climber. So I was listening to a podcast with a famous rock climber named Alex Honnold a few weeks ago. And in the middle of this podcast, which was not about banking at all, it was about rock climbing, um, Alex Honnold uh, kind of went on a rant about banking being a way to make a social impact. So I'm gonna play you a little clip from that podcast that really I thought was pretty eye-opening for me. Because so, so banking is pretty much the, the number one thing that you can do for personal impact, which is funny because it's so much less satisfying than like changing your diet, mm -hmm. let's say, because it's less obvious. But the thing is, wherever you bank, you know, they're using your money the whole time that it sits in whatever yeah. account, you know, like you put it into an account, and then they're investing it in things, they're spending it, they're like using it basically. And so, you know, a famous example is like Wells Fargo with the code access pipeline or something. But in general, every bank, you know, every major bank in America is supporting both sides of the political aisle. They're so, you know, here's a millennial who's got a huge following, very influential, who says that, you know, basically banking is the number one thing you can do to make social impact. So in other words, align your money with your values. That's something that a lot of a lot of banks, especially the big banks, are going to struggle with. These younger customers, they care about the business that they're placing their money with. Because so, so the final thing I'll mention is, and this really applies um, to to our bank, Central Pacific Bank. You know, being located in Hawaii for decades, we've had the benefit of being part of the community. You know, the geography is largely dictated who our customers are. And I saw this quote in a Forbes magazine article the other day on the left side here, and I'll read it. In some respects, challenger banks have become the new community bank. It's just that the communities they serve aren't geographic communities, but affinity-based communities. So borders are less meaningful going forward and in the future. Really, affinity is the new geography. And so you're starting to see neobanks like First Boulevard that caters to African-American customers or Daylight that caters to the LGBTQ community. And when you're, uh, you know, I often say there's riches and niches. Is so what you're seeing is specialization within banking, and but you can only do it if you do it in an authentic way. So a question for us and for many other banks and many businesses in general is, you know, what's the what's the affinity group that you can authentically serve? So with that in mind, let's talk a little bit about our history and then how we translate that into a strategy given all the context I just provided. So. Our bank, Central Pacific Bank, has probably the best origin story of any company I've ever heard of. So um, in the wake of World War II, our bank was founded by World War II vets, Japanese World War II vets, who couldn't get served by the existing banks in the Hawaiian Islands. And you can imagine being a Japanese resident of Hawaii in the wake of World War II, probably not a pleasant experience. And so from day one, our bank was founded and built to really serve the underserved. And we've got this incredible legacy of obsessive customer service that, that remains in place today. I'll tell you, when I first visited Hawaii to, to uh, interview with, with the team, you know, I heard from my Uber driver, from my real estate agent, just over the top reviews of Central Pacific Bank. And it really is true that it's, it's you know, kind of somewhat unique in the banking world in terms of the level of service that's provided. I'll talk in a second about some of the, the measures of that. So now fast forward 60 years and CPB is a public bank. We're listed on the New York Stock Exchange. We've got $7 billion in assets, headquartered in Honolulu. We have a technology office now in Boulder, Colorado. I mentioned that I split my time between the two. We have a small team here in Boulder that, that really um, is responsible for our digital products. Our CEO, I mentioned earlier, Paul Yunomine is the former head of IBM Japan. So he's not a banker by trade. He brings more of a technology spin to the bank, which has been amazing. You know, our bank was actually number one of all 10,000 banks in the U.S. in terms of 
the market share that we had in our state for PPP loans. So that shows our commitment to serving our, our business customers, especially our small business customers. I mentioned customer service. If you're familiar with the Net Promoter Score, our score is over 80. Now, if you don't know anything about the score, I'm not going to explain it, um, go into the details, but let's just say that this puts us in a very elite group of companies. I mean, when you see a net promoter score over 70, you're talking about the apples of the world. And then one thing we're also proud of is we're, we're a very diverse company. We're 90% ethnically diverse, two thirds female. So we have an authentic story to build from. The challenge we have though is all the things we've done that are amazing that got us here won't get us there. You know, the world is changing before our very eyes. And especially in the new post COVID world, things are dramatically different. So for us, when, shortly after I joined the company, we kind of went back to the drawing board and we started with strategy. We, we took a look at all the information I just shared with you. We took a look at the, the global marketplace, the US banking market, our local market in Hawaii. We did lots of deep research with, with customers. We did one-on-ones. We did many focus groups. We talked to dozens of employees to arrive at really a brand strategy. You know, and, and it's tempting for companies when you're, when you're setting off to do a rebrand to immediately jump into, you know, the fun stuff, right? The, the colors and the pretty logos and, um, and, and the visuals. But the most important thing you can do is to take a step back and say, really, what is, what is the core strategy that is going to inform everything we do? And so in our case, after all that research, we arrived on a strategy of radically human. So it's this idea that, that, you know, what you're seeing happening in banking is most banks, especially the big banks, are using technology to automate transactions and in a way become less human than ever. We actually want to go the exact opposite direction. We want to use technology to become more human because our customers want that human connection. In fact, we want to be radically human. So this, these words radically human, you can probably imagine what a bank might start to look like that is radically human. And that's, that's the role of a brand strategy is it should inform everything you do from the way things look to the way that you act to the way that your products work. So, so I'm gonna play a quick video that really kind of captures the essence of this radically human idea. And keep in mind that we did all this work right in the midst of the pandemic. So it's got a heavy pandemic spin to it, but I think you'll get the idea. Fear can bring out the worst in people. Tragedy can take what we hold dear. Technology can cause isolation. But humanity, humanity gives us hope. Humanity brings out the best in people. Humanity brings us together. So when the world suddenly seems so uncertain, so radically challenging and radically different, now's the time to say something other banks can't say. Now is the time to be something other banks can't be. Now is the time to be radically human. So I've probably seen that video uh, at least 50 times now, and it still gives me chills every time I watch it, because you know, really in, in today's world, humanity is in short supply. And I love this as a brand positioning because you know, uh, the, the whole idea behind a brand is to create something distinctive and to say things that your competitors can't say. And I'm pretty sure that Wells Fargo you know, the board of directors at Wells Fargo isn't sitting in meetings talking about how they can become radically human, but we are, and that's going to be our unique uh, brand territory that we're, we'll stake out. So now the question is, how do you translate that brand strategy into action? You know, how do you deliver radical humanity at scale, given all the changes that are happening in banking that I covered earlier? And so for us, it's been this very large uh, modernization and transformation project, which means really three things. It's a new look and feel. So I'll walk you through, in just a second, I'll walk you through um, the, the new brand that we've created around this idea of radically radical humanity. Um, new places, you know, we still have 
a business in Hawaii that, that has um, over 30 branches. We have a big headquarters in downtown Honolulu. We wanted those places to represent our radically human brand. And then finally, and most importantly, our new digital first products. And I'll show you all of this. So it all starts with um, the new look and feel. So um, we drew inspiration actually from the city of Honolulu. You know, th what's interesting about Honolulu as, um, as sort of the, the business hub of Hawaii is it really came into its own in the mid fifties. You know, Hawaii became a state around that time. And at that point, the mid century modernist movement was in full effect. And so we took inspiration from the architecture of the mid-century modernist movement. So the picture on the right here is actually the IBM building, which is designed by a famous Russian architect uh, in the early 60s. This, actually, this building actually is right across the street from where I live in Honolulu. So I see it all the time. And at night, when it lights up, they've got multicolored lights in all those little openings in that concrete superstructure. Uh, so we took inspiration from that mid-century modern feel. It feels uniquely Hawaiian. We actually look to our past also. So our word mark is surprisingly simple, simple and strong. So we actually drew inspiration from one of our branches um, from back in the 60s and we modernized it a bit. So simple, st strong and clear. But to bring some life to the brand, we started with a color palette that was drawn from the natural elements of the Hawaiian Islands. So we have colors like swell and sand and midnight, plumeria, Pacific, papaya and hibiscus that really bring some energy to the brand. And then based on those, that, that palette of colors, we commissioned some custom iconography, some custom illustrations that really um, make a nice just, juxtaposition against our very simple word mark. So we've got our North Shore wave that symbolizes strength, opportunity, and adventure. We've got the koi fish, which is a nod to our, our Japanese heritage and symbolizes good fortune, perseverance, and prosperity. We've got, the, of course, the North, Northern Pacific humpback whale, which symbolizes wisdom, creativity, strength, and communication. And then my favorite, which is, we call it the shaka cat, which is our version of the Japanese maneki neko, which is a symbol of good fortune. So ours has sunglasses, uh, of course, because it's always sunny in Hawaii, and, I, and, it, and he's rocking the shaka symbol. So when you start to see how these illustrations and this new word mark are used to bring everything we do to life, all of our touch points, it starts to become really powerful and distinctive. For example, here's some ATM surrounds and you, you really can't walk by one of these surrounds without taking notice. It doesn't feel like any other bank in Hawaii or on the mainland. Our cards, here's how, here's how that look translates into our cards for both business and consumer. And then of course, digital products. So we've done a complete reboot of our digital products and you know, our, our products today are on par with any bank in Hawaii or on the mainland. And they've, they, you know, they've got this feel of radical humanity that comes through even in a digital world. And then I talked about our places. So we did something pretty radical with our headquarters building, which is in downtown Honolulu. We transformed the entire first floor into a co-working space. And there's an Aloha Beer Company location. There's a Starbucks pickup location. It's a free co-working space for anybody in the community to use. It's got conference rooms, quiet workspaces. Um, this is part of our ongoing transformation. We're now bringing this new look to all of our branches. One of the other things we did that was pretty bold is we commissioned a, uh, a custom and very iconic work of art. And I, my words won't do this justice. So I, I encourage you to visit cpb.bank slash Kai, K-A-I, to see this piece of um, to see this piece of art, which we call Kai in action. Essentially, what it is is it's 38 computer-controlled rain sticks. So, if you know what a rain stick is, when you move them, they've got beads in them that make noise, and it sounds like water. And so, imagine 38 of them in concert moving. And what's even cooler about it is uh, this is the rain sticks are connected in real time to wave data from buoys off the shore of all the islands. And so they mimic the sound and the motion of the waves in our offices in downtown Honolulu. It's really something that you have to see to believe. And really, you know, why would we do this? Well, it's really part of this idea of being radically human. There's nothing more powerful, in my opinion, than creating a vibe than art. And so for our customers that visit, for our employees that walk into this building every day, it really sets the tone for everything we do. 
And then of course, advertising. So I'm going to show you a couple of TV ads that we created. I'm, I couldn't be more proud of these TV ads. The agency that helped us really create this whole brand is an agency called Phenomenon out of LA. I've worked with them across three different companies and they helped us create this whole brand system, but also came up with an, uh, a really, uh, I think a genius idea for our TV ads. The, the, in my opinion, the best ideas for advertising are really simple. And so the idea here was to bring those amazing illustrations we created to life, but setting them to the voices of real CPD customers. So we actually went out on the streets and, and talked to our customers. It was completely, uns none of this was scripted. And we captured sound bites that we think capture the essence of what it means to be radically human and how you serve customers in a radically human way. So I'm gonna play you just a couple of commercials. This first one is a 30 second ad. So I opened this account with this other bank and I told a guy, okay. So I go, I need a roll of quarters. And he goes, well, I'm sorry, I can't give you that. He goes, no, you have to have a business account. I'm like, whoa, what? So I said, okay, I want to close my account. And he looked at me, I go, I'm serious. And I closed the account and that was that. I just walk into CPB, go, I need to roll quarters and no problems. Everybody's smiling and I walk out. Central Pacific Bank. So as you can see, you know, these, these commercials are based on just simple but very powerful stories that we can all relate to. We produced a number of these. I'm going to show you one more TV ad, and it's a 15-second ad. This one has actually um, become a huge favorite internally because it was somewhat controversial because, as you'll see, this, um, this TV ad makes use of a local dialect called Pidgin. It's a local Hawaiian dialect, and, um, and it's something you don't see on, on TV anywhere. But again, this was an unscripted moment that just came from a customer. And so we set it to the illustration. We thought that our, our Shaka cat was the perfect fit for the vibe of this spot. So check this one out. If you get a hard time understanding bank language, you should come to Central Pacific Bank because you're going to Maupopo, everything that they're telling you, they're going to help you understand and it's going to be cherry. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be all good, all G. It's so funny. Yeah. Do -do 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 -do. Central Pacific Bank. So, you know, how could you not like these TV ads? They're heartwarming and they perfectly represent our brand idea. So even that jingle at the end with the guy singing was, this is not a, a paid singer, paid actor. This came naturally in our interviews with customers. And then we had this tagline where people like banking. It says it very, in a very simple way. And then finally, you know, obviously, you know, digital is a big part of our future and our present. And so, you know, in increasingly I'm diverting our ad budget to digital channels, especially social media. Um, and, and really our one of our first big forays into social and content is through a partnership with Carissa Moore. And if you don't know who Carissa Moore is, um, you'll see her a lot of her soon because she's the leading contender for gold medal in Japan in women's surfing. She's a, the, the, the number one rated um, uh, women surfer in the world. And so we, we've done a partnership with her and um, there'll be several stages to it, but we just rolled out the first one and um, it's really aimed at sort of um, acts of kindness. So Carissa, we, had, we, we shot a number of sort of spontaneous um, uh, video ads of Carissa visiting her favorite local businesses during the pandemic and um, literally sending them money using our, our mobile banking app. So really fun. It's gotten a lot of traction online, and this is going to be a big part of our future. So that's just a very quick rundown of some of the transformation that's happened so far. You know, we really do feel like we're just getting started, um, but, but, you know, I want to try to wrap this up into a few um, sort of keys to success. If there's any things you can take away from this and maybe apply to your own business. And, you know, number one, and I talked about this a lot, is it starts with strategy, right? Before you jump into the tactics of you know, building products or creating you know, new logo, whatever, go back and do the research, talk to customers and, and make sure you've got the strategy right because it really does inform everything. The second thing is to think holistically. You know, um, I think if you said, you know, what is a brand to a lot of people, they would probably associate it with you know, a logo or, or certain colors or a TV ad. But really what a brand is, it's how your customers feel about your company. And so in that context, a brand is everything that you do. It's all your touch points. So it's everything from the way that we greet customers to the way our products look, to the way our products work, to our spaces. And so we really tried to think about this transformation in a very holistic way. And then finally, and the single most important thing is 
when you do a transformation like this, you really have to put the effort to bring everyone along on the journey. You know, we've got over 800 employees at Central Pacific Bank. And I'll tell you, um, during this, this transformation, we did multi-hour brand workshops with every single employee in the company. And it was a, a huge effort, but it really paid off in a huge way because we had buy-in and we got ideas from our employees along the way. And so that when we launched the brand, everybody knew what was going on and everybody could be an evangelist. That was a huge key to success for us. So I'll, I'll conclude by kind of talking a little bit uh, about what's next. And unfortunately, I can't share a lot of details here, but I can give you some ideas of directionally where we're headed. Um, you know, I was hired to really do two things at the bank. Number one is to um, help really drive the transformation that had already begun to become a digital first bank, um, really focused on Hawaii. Uh, the second part of my job, though, um, our CEO, Paul, gave me the mandate that you know, look, we need to be thinking outside of Hawaii. We've got um, a large uh, customer base in Japan. The mainland is untapped for us. And so we're really thinking beyond our borders going forward. And we've got some exciting stuff in the pipeline that I can't quite talk about yet, but I'll drop some hints on you. So, you know, what, what is the future? Given everything that I've talked about, you know, imagine a bank that aligns your money with your values. Back to that quote from that famous rock climber, Alex Honnold, this is what customers increasingly want. You know, imagine a bank that puts all your products in one beautiful app. You know, even though most banks have digital banking apps, most haven't done a great job at bringing everything together in a simple way where all of your products work well together and you can move money without friction. You know, imagine transacting effortlessly in cash, credit, or crypto. You know, whether or not you own crypto today, it's a big part of our future. And so we're really thinking about these things interchangeably. And imagine, for example, if you're in your app, you could just swipe with your thumb and move cash around between credit or crypto or your checking account. And then of course, we'll never lose sight of our obsession with customer service. And so we're thinking a lot about how do you deliver Aloha service at scale? So we're investing heavily in things like text chat, video chat, uh, that, that'll be a big part of our future and it'll be something we always differentiate on. So in short, you know, I can't tell you what we're working on, especially as it relates to our mainland projects. But I'll just drop one last hint that I can tell you that our future looks swell. So I'll let you draw your own conclusions about where we're headed from there. So with that, I'll, I'll wrap up and I'll just say, you know, if you, if you have any questions or want to reach out to me, my email is on the screen. You can follow me on Twitter. I do want to give a shout out to some of our agency partners who have been played a, a huge role in this transformation. So I mentioned on the brand side, you know, Phenomenon is our agency of record. Our media agency is Anthology Group in Honolulu. Um, and then I, I mentioned the importance of managing organizational change and rolling out the brand in a collaborative way with employees. We hired a consultant actually named David Cole who specializes in that. So David's email address is on the screen too. He's fantastic if you're in the midst of driving change in your organization and want some help really getting buy-in from your employees. So with that, I'll stop and um, I'm happy to take any questions that you guys uh, might have. I'm looking at the, uh, the, the Q&A right here. Someone said it would be great to hear a separate presentation at a later time about rock climbing. Nothing would make me happier. It's probably my favorite topic. Um, we've got, uh, yeah, so we've got a question from Lance says, how does CPB address the item that many consumers dislike the most? Fees for every little thing, kind of the nickel and diming that add up to a really high APR and they make up a lot of the, the uh, commercial bank models profit. That's a great question. And that's really, that's an issue that's being forced by many of these neo banks because a lot of the neo bank products, one of the things that's appealing about them is they're essentially fee free. And it is true that banks uh, historically have relied on fees, for example, overdraft fees to drive a lot of their profit. So banks are being forced to really become more customer centric and to find new ways to drive profit. So that's, that's a huge challenge. I can tell you that in our case, um, we're, that's something we're thinking about a lot and a lot of our new products will have pretty dramatically different fee structures. Um, got another question here from Kim. It sounds like the whole process of developing a brand strategy is something I'd really enjoy and excel at it, but I, but I fell into marketing accidentally. Uh, and I'm mostly self-taught. Do you have any recommendations on who else to track down, especially in Honolulu, that may be willing to share some of their experiences in this arena? 
how did you get started doing this kind of work? What do you enjoy most and least about it? Wow, that's a lot, a lot of questions. Um, so I'll try to answer it quickly. Um, so I actually um, ended up in marketing accidentally myself. Um, my education, it, believe it or not, is in engineering. But I came out of school at a time when um, the internet was just starting to take off. This is in the mid 90s. And, you know, I always knew that I enjoyed creative work. And with, with the internet, when, when, you know, the internet meets marketing meant that there was both science and art to marketing. And I really enjoyed both aspects of that. And so I kind of consciously worked my way into it. And, and so, you know, I'd say the great thing about marketing is it's very much a, a job where the best idea wins. So I don't think many senior marketing executives, myself included, care a whole lot about um, the background or how many years of, of marketing experience. We're looking for talented, smart people with great ideas and, you know, who have a lot of energy. And so, um, you know, Kim, if you want to reach out to me, I'd be happy to tell you more. Um, but, but, you know, I, I think there's a lot of great, and I can also introduce you to a lot of the people I've met in Honolulu specifically who are, you know, great marketers and, and also more importantly, great people. And then Kevin, let me jump in with a couple of questions also. Great. Um, how did you, how did you get the feedback from the employees during this whole transformation? Yeah, um, several ways. I'd say, you know, the, the primary way I mentioned that we did these marketing workshops. So we had, and, and this was during the pandemic. So we did this all via Zoom and it worked out. And actually in some ways, Zoom worked better for this than face-to-face than -face meetings because people felt more empowered to, to, to ask questions and to speak up. And so it worked really well, but the way it worked is we have 800 people in our company, as I mentioned. And so we did uh, many, many brand workshops, usually limiting them to about 20 or 30 people per workshop. And we walked through the whole strategy and literally solicited um, um, direct feedback. In fact, we had exercises, it was um, four or five exercises throughout the two or three hour workshop that, that um, actually we kind of forced employees to think about um, how the new brand, new brand strategy would change the way they work. And so that we, we had to, we, you know, we really asked them to think about how do they live the brand? How do they represent the brand? Um, and so again, that was a huge, I mean, huge key to success because getting buy-in on these things is, is everything. Too often you see brands rolled out where they're created in a vacuum by maybe the marketing team or the executive team and then they're to kind of hand it off. Here's your brand, and uh, and that usually doesn't doesn't work too well. You've really got to have buy-in. Oh, that's great. And then digital transformation. It, it sounds like you guys have been at it for quite a while. What was the most challenging part of it, and how did you overcome it? Most challenging part of our transformation. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll, I'll say um, what comes to mind is the thing that I thought would be uh, the most challenging. Um, but did not end up being that, which was, you know, anytime you're driving massive change in an organization, it's really hard. I mean, culture is hard to change. And, you know, coming in, because I've done this a couple of times before, and coming in, I thought that, um, that getting buy-in and getting people to embrace change was going to be the, the, the biggest challenge. And actually, was incredibly pleasantly surprised that our employees really across, the, I mean, there's always exceptions, right? There's always haters. But, but in general, our employees really embraced this change. I mean, I think they saw that this was the direction we're headed. And, and frankly, a lot of it starts at the top. I mean, our, starting with our CEO and then all the way down, everybody knew that we were committed to making change. And so that, that was a huge help. And, you know, I guess I'm, I am fundamentally an optimist. Like, it's really hard for me to answer questions around, you know, what was the most challenging, this or that, because... Um, I don't really think of them as, I mean, I just, I just accept that it's like, that's part of my job is to, to deal with the ups and downs that happen through these projects. But uh, overall, I think, you know, I had a little bit of the benefit of having done this a few times before. So I had some confidence in the playbook that we ran because there are, there are points along the way where, you know, you get challenged and you're not sure. Um, but that's where experience pays off a little bit. Got it. We have a question from Luke Wilson. Will behavior economics play a factor in the way consumers interact with their online accounts? Any ideas on ways to nudge customers in a more beneficial direction? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, a couple of things on that. So it's a really good point, first of all, is that, you know, uh, not only do your employees have to be bought in, our customers have to be uh, bought into this program as well. 
And um, so driving change among customers is difficult. Now, the good news is the world is rapidly going toward digital first anyway, and the pandemic accelerated that. But I will tell you, you know, in Hawaii in particular, a lot of our customers still prefer face-to-face -face interactions in our branches. And so we're doing some things actually right now in our branches to help educate our customers about the benefits of digital first. So for a exa simple example in banking, you know, and many of you probably by virtue of attending this, you know, um, you're already doing this, but you know, one of the primary reasons people come into a bank branch is to deposit a paper check. Well, almost all banks these days offer, you know, the ability to deposit paper checks via the mobile app. You take pictures of it. And so simple things like training customers in the branch, how to do that. So guess what? Now you don't have to drive into the branch every day. Um, so it's, it's little things like that. It's just, you know, training customers over time. Looks like we've got another question here. You know, how do you stay up to date on the general marketing knowledge and ever-changing trends, especially with social media? You know, this is a great question and, and it's, um, it's super important. Like, I will tell you that the, the world is changing so fast and especially the marketing world and especially the online marketing world is changing so fast. It's almost a daily basis. You know, I guess... I have a little bit of a natural benefit built in and that I love this stuff. So I'm always, you know, I'm on social media, I'm on Twitter all the time. I, uh, I view it as part of my job, but it's also just a personal interest of mine to stay up to date on what's happening in, in marketing. And so I guess the, the, the really like sort of philosophical answer to that question is, you know, whatever your job is, try to find something that you're interested in beyond just, you know, working and getting a paycheck. Try to find something that you, you have interest in from a personal standpoint, because you're always going to perform better at that job if it's something you love. And again, you know, I came out of school um, thinking I was going to be an engineer, and thank goodness I, I, I didn't take that path because um, I was not wired to be an engineer. I'm wired to be a marketer. I have another question from Ellen. Um, other financial entities such as Elevis, which is a robo-investing service, and even Robinhood are offering services that slowly position th themselves to be um, to move into banking. They have a stronghold in their respective niches. Would you consider them as competitors? Are there specific niches that CPB is looking to at, is looking at besides the younger generation? Yeah, so it's a great point. You know, I, I, I mentioned, I had that slide early on that said the neobanks are coming. I would consider, you know, Robinhood and companies like that to be you know, neobank type companies, huge customer bases. Um, and, you know, they're, they're going to be a real threat to, to banking. The good news is there can be many, many, many winners in banking. So I mentioned that banking will become more specialized. And even today, you know, there are 10,000 banks out there. And so, um, you know, for sure, you know, the, the Robin Hoods of the world are competitors, uh, but there's also room for lots of winners that serve specific uh, market niches. And so, um, you know, the, the market will continue to evolve. I think some, you know, banks that aren't forward thinking and don't invest in technology are going to have real problems. Um, but that's why, you know, speaking for ourselves, that's why we're trying to be ahead of the curve and making those investments today and really you know, changing ourselves before change is forced upon us. Great, thank you. Um, and then does digital transformation ever end? What's... Uh, does the transformation ever end? Yeah. Oh, wow, that's a great question. Uh, the, uh, the, the answer is no. I mean, I think the world, this is the world we live in, right? I mean, that's why your organization exists is, you know, um, there's, there's no complacency, you know, complacency is not a good strategy. And so, yeah, it, it never does end. And, and even as you think about the way your organization is designed, I mentioned that we've now got a, a digital products team in Boulder, you know, that product, that team didn't exist a year from now. And now we've got six people, um, in, including myself, focusing on this stuff and it never ends. I mean, we're going to continue to evolve and innovate and obviously, you know, more and more investment dollars will be shifting to digital. Any comments on working um, with a remote team? I know that COVID has forced a lot of people to, to be remote, but social yeah. distancing being separated. It's great, great question. So um, I, I'm probably a little biased on this because I've been remote for uh, over three years, even before I joined CPB. And I think what a lot of companies were surprised by when, when they were forced to go remote is that it worked really well. Like I can speak for CPB, 
we didn't miss a beat. In fact, we've, you know, if you even watch our, our earnings announcements for the past few quarters, we're performing better than ever, but just, just announced one of our best quarters ever. And so, you know, it, it works really well. I think, you know, you have to make a little bit of extra effort to stay in touch and to, to over communicate. Um, you know, there's definitely some tips and tricks to it, but you know, that's the world we live in now. I think we're never going back to a completely office centric culture. And so, uh, companies that don't embrace that are going to struggle. Uh, we've got, we've now got employees really spread, uh, <laughs> in several locations on the mainland now. And that, you know, two years ago, I think that would have been considered a crazy idea for, for our, our business. Um, so I'm seeing what, maybe one more question and then we'll wrap it up here. Um, uh, random question. What is something you read or a podcast you listened to that you thought was inspiring or motivating recently? And now there's a rel related question here. It says, I first heard you on a podcast with Chris Powers. Can you talk about purpose in your work? Wow. So I'll try to answer all this bundled up together. So, you know, someone asked an earlier question about how to stay up to speed on what's happening um, in, in, in marketing or in business. And podcasts are incredible. It's like, it's, it's kind of hard to believe that all this great stuff is, is out there for free. And it's, it's really in some ways kind of overwhelming. And so I do listen, you know, when I'm going on a walk or when I'm driving, I listen to, to podcasts. Um, I actually personally um, draw a lot of inspiration from, from um, learning about things outside of my immediate work. So things outside of banking or outside of marketing. So, you know, in, in my case, you know, I, I get a lot of inspiration from climbing and I listen to other climbers about some of the challenges they face. Um, and then to, to the second question, you know, uh, can I talk about purpose in, in my work? You know, I kind of talked about this a little bit is, is in kind of finding something that you're really passionate about. You know, for me, um, I'm probably on the extreme of it's hard for me to be a great uh, employee if I'm not passionate about what I'm doing. So for me, you know, at a very early age, I had to sort of search my soul and figure out what it is that I'm really passionate about. And, you know, I, I talk a lot about not only the work side of it, you know, finding purpose in the work side of it, but I talk a lot about being multidimensional, meaning that no matter how much you love your work, it's not enough. And if you want to have true happiness, you have to have multiple dimensions to your life, obviously family, but also I believe a pursuit outside of work, which for me is climbing, but for someone else could be anything. Um, but I think that really brings a new, a, a, a much a super important dimension to your life. It introduces you to different people. And when one area of your life's not going well, you always have these other areas to lean on. So this idea of being multidimensional is something I've written about on Twitter, if you guys want to check it out. And then last question, um, what's CPB's competitive advantage compared to mainland banks as CPB expands beyond Hawaii? Unfortunately, I can't talk a lot, a lot about specifics here, but I can tell you that that is the central question we asked ourselves as we started to build, um, uh, think about our mainland strategy. We did not want to be a me too uh, bank. And so we've really put a lot of effort into building out features that, um, that are unique in the marketplace. And I will tell you that, um, th that, that the advantage that we have compared to neobanks without getting too geeky, you know, without geeking out too much on the details, we are a bank, but we also are behaving like a fintech. I mentioned we have this, this group in Boulder. And so I like to think we have the best of both like behaving like a startup, but we're also a bank because all these neobanks, whether it be Robinhood or anybody else on the back end, they have to actually partner with a chartered bank. And um, so if you look at the fine print on any of these, these neobanks websites, it'll tell you which bank they've partnered with to provide these services. And that's ultimately um, a, a challenging relationship to manage in terms of innovation, because the, the, the neobank can only innovate as much as their, their bank sponsor will let them. And in our case, we are the bank, we are the fintech. Uh, and so I think that's, you know, at a, at a top level, you can imagine all sorts of interesting things you can do when you kind of bring it all together and have the best of both worlds. So with that, uh, I, I think I'll, I'll stop there. There's a lot of great questions. I've been talking a lot. You know, thank you again, Michelle, and thanks to everybody for your time. And again, uh, my, my email address and, and my Twitter handle are on the screen. Feel free to reach out to me um, anytime. And I, I'm, I'm pretty responsive 24 seven. So again, uh, thank you everybody. 
Great, thank you, Kevin. Thank you so much for, for sharing everything you did and thank you to the audience for the wonderful questions.